I think we can start now. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, the speakers, um, to being here. So today uh, we're going to talk about expanding broadband access to rural and remote areas. And um, the, the session will be structured uh, first with a, a, an intro and then we'll, we'll separate into the challenges and then the innovations. So just to start and to frame uh, the question, uh, I'd like to 
to recall that uh, the UN Agenda for Sustainable Development specifically acknowledges ICTs and Internet as a horizontal enabler uh, for development. Uh, the, the Internet also is, is often described as a, a general purpose, purpose technology and the foundation of the digital economy. But here at the IGF, um, the ongoing discussions seem to somehow to have overcome the issue, so we don't see a lot of uh, workshops that are actually dealing with the problem of access. And this workshop aims to address uh, this issue. The fact is that over half of uh, the world's population, an estimated about 53%, uh, is still not using the internet by the end of 2016, with only 49% penetration um, for mobile broadband subscriptions and 12% for fixed broadband. So expanding the broadband services for rural and remote areas continue to be a major challenge uh, to include people in the digital economy and the digital transformation. And this is not only a challenge in developing countries, but also in many developed countries. Uh, today I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the OECD, and I would just like to highlight the fact that even the OECD countries where penetrations are higher, that is 99% of penetration for mobile broadband and 30% of for a fixed broadband, closing the rural uh, digital gap is still an unfinished task. So for some OECD countries, while the differences in internet penetration may be less dramatic than in others, even in those that are doing relatively well, uh, when you break out the data in terms of uh, speeds to which rural areas have access to, in comparison to urban areas, the picture is still quite grim. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a problem, and more needs to be done about it. The continued growth in demand uh, on bandwidth will require not only that everyone's connected, but also that the networks continue to be upgraded. And the purpose of the workshop is to bring together representatives from diverse stakeholder groups to discuss this issue. So as I said, uh, the session is divided into two. The first one will focus on the challenges on connecting rural areas and the second one on innovative solutions. For the challenges segment, uh, we'll map the state of play uh, in the world and in selected regions, and then we'll ask the panelists to share some of the new policy and technology approaches for bridging the gaps. Um, so to, we have a lot of uh, ground to cover, so I'll, I'll, I'll get right to it. Uh, opening our first part of the session on the challenges will be uh, Doreen Bogdan-Martin, uh, uh, Doreen is ITU's Chief of Staff, uh, Chief of Strategic Planning and Membership and Executive Secretary of the UN Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. She held several senior positions at the ITU before. She is leading authority on regulatory and policy trends worldwide and has co-authored a number of ITU publications. Uh, before joining the ITU, she worked in the Telecommunications Policy Specialist in the National, in NTIA in the USA. So, um, I give you the word. Thank you very much, uh, Lorraine, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, as many of you know, the theme of this year's IGF is about shaping our digital future. And of course, when we talk about shaping our digital future, we need to make sure that it's an inclusive digital future. And if I think about the opening ceremony, on Monday afternoon, I think one of the, the concluding messages was that we should be working towards an internet for everyone. So male, female, young, old, rural, urban. So we need to make sure that everyone is included. And that's only going to happen if all stakeholders are involved. Each and every player has a role in connecting the unconnected. And Lorraine, I commend you in putting together such a, a multi-stakeholder panel uh, with governments, international organizations, the private sector, and civil society together, because it's only through all of us working together that we will succeed. Uh, as many of you also know, the ITU, uh, the International Telecommunications Union, which is just across the street, has a DNA, uh, has connectivity in its DNA, that's our core, uh, but we will only succeed uh, if we work with all of you. We can't do that alone. Lorraine has laid out some of the numbers. I'd just like to 
maybe recap on some of the points that you mentioned and, and add a few more. Um, our recent statistics show us that uh, it's more than half of the world's population that are still offline, uh, 52 percent. Um, and in the developing world, it's, it's closer to 59 percent almost of the developing world uh, that is offline, uh, which means that three out of five people are offline uh, in the developing world. And then when we look at the least developed countries, we become more concerned uh, because only one in seven are online. And if we look at seven, there are seven economies still today where internet penetration is less than 5%. And when I walked into the room today, someone asked me what was the, the pin that I was wearing. Uh, and this pin is the representation of the 17 sustainable development goals. And I mention that because the sustainable development goal number nine, specifically 9C, calls for us to achieve universal and affordable connectivity, universal and affordable connectivity by 2020. And ladies and gentlemen, that means that we have a lot of work to do. Um, in two so, years. <laughs> in two years. Uh, we almost need a miracle. Uh, but seeing the discussions here at the IGF, I think we can be optimistic that we, the numbers will get better. Uh, my colleagues tell me that uh, if uh, growth rates continue, that we should at least have a 50-50, 50% 50, uh, 50 of the world's population should be online by 2019. And my colleague, Philippa, is in the room. Uh, and she was going over the stats with me before, uh, before I came. So we do have lots to do. Uh, we are also concerned that when we look at, at 4G and even 5G, what we're seeing is that 4G is being rolled out in areas that are already covered by 3G. So again, when we look at rural areas and rural populations, this is something of concern. So we see lots of new gaps, new gaps in, in speed, as I mentioned. Uh, we also see more gaps in the area of affordability. Affordability is one of the greatest challenges uh, when we look at connecting rural areas. Uh, we continue to have an urban-rural divide, and we also have a gap uh, between men and women. So why are there so many people offline? It is clearly a lack of infrastructure. It is a problem with affordability. It's also a problem with awareness. So often people are not getting online simply because they don't have the awareness of the benefits of connectivity. We also see lots of problems around digital skills. Uh, and I think Hilani is going to comment more on that. Uh, in one of the sessions this morning, it was noted uh, and I, I, I glimpsed at your opening slide, and I had written it down myself. If you build it, they don't necessarily come. So we need to do a lot more on the supply side. We need to make sure that people have the needed skills to make the best use of that connectivity when they receive it. And we also need to make sure that the content is there, that the relevant content is there, for those users in rural communities uh, that can benefit from it once they're connected. And that also means that we need to be tackling local languages. Of course, there's also the issue of trust. This is another issue that was raised in the opening ceremony and has continued throughout a number of sessions here at the IGF. One of the reasons that people choose often not to be connected, even if they have the technology, uh, and they are able to afford it is often uh, due to a lack of trust in the network. So what can we do? What can we all do here at the IGF? We believe that we need more innovative models. Uh, we need more public-private partnerships. And that's where I want to make reference to the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. It was set up back in 2010 to help accelerate the achievement to the MDGs, now the SDGs. Uh, and it's a group of policy 
uh, uh, it's private and public uh, high-level representatives that are working to advocate uh, around the globe for what is needed on the policy side to stimulate connectivity. That group has set up a number of targets which we believe have been very helpful in trying to move the needle. We have a target on broadband policies uh, and since that target was set, uh, we have many more countries that have set up broadband policies. And I wanted to mention specifically when it comes to rural, because that group looks, they do deep dives in the form of working groups, and they have uh, recently set up a group on um, satellite uh, space and upper atmosphere technologies. Uh, and that group has looked specifically at rural connectivity challenges and what comes out in that report is that there is lots of hope because in, on the technology side there are technology solutions out there uh, and some uh, colleagues in the room uh, may elaborate further on that robert pepper has been involved in the work of the the broadband commission uh, for many years but that report uh, leaves us with a feeling of optimism we need to be more we need to be more innovative we need to find the right regulatory models and approaches, but the technologies are there that will enable us to actually connect uh, the most far-reaching corners of the world. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you very much, Doreen, for that. Uh, that was a great overview. Uh, now I'll pass the word to um, Elani. Elani Galpaya is uh, the CEO of Lunasia. Uh, think tank working across the emerging Asia Pacific on ICT policy and regulation issues. Her recent research is around understanding how labor is changing uh, in due, to, due to digitization, barriers to ICT access, net neutrality, and how people negotiate privacy and security online. I'll pass the word to Ellen now. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so while the panel is about rural connectivity, implying it's about the pipes, wires, and the uh, spectrum in the last mile, I actually thought I'd take a slightly holistic view about people actually getting connected, so not just rolling out the infrastructure, but why are people not online? Um, even in countries where, even in urban areas, where there is very good connectivity, whereas there is 4G in some of the developing countries, still people are not online. So the assumption is that we will build it and they will come. And in the developing world, we really aren't sure. There's a whole lot going on beyond just having access to a signal. So what I will just go through a few slides which actually have data. These are um, um, nationally representative household and individual ICT access and use surveys. So huge, large sample representative of the population between 15 to 65 in each of these countries. This is data collected um, sort of anywhere between this year, uh, literally so from some countries as early, late as last week. So apologies for bad formatting, etc. We're in the process of analyzing. This is very early data. And this is part of a global project called After Access, if you want to follow the Twitter handle. So um, in the three regions, I've just always in the slides, we'll have Africa or to, to, to your left, Asia in the middle and Latin America. Um, so, you know, uh, internet use is low. Africa and Asia perform really poorly. Um, so Asia, for example, if you take as a region, India with over 1.2 billion people will dominate the Asian region. And we're looking at connectivity being in a really, really bad state. Um, Latin America has made significant progress. So these are people who use the internet using a very wide definition of the internet, meaning anything from a browser to Gmail, Facebook, email, and you know, very apps and so on. However, when you break down that data by urban versus rural dwellers, there is a huge gap, as you can see. Uh, the gap is really, really stark in certain countries. Oh, sorry, next. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I forget. Somebody else is controlling the slides. My apologies. <laughs> the, the gap is really stark. Countries like Rwanda, India, Cambodia, these gaps are huge. Next slide. So what are some of the conditions for getting online? 
One, obviously, is some kind of device. And if we look at mobile phone ownership, it's actually quite respectable, right? I mean, we, ha we still have a yet long way to go to 100%, but it's getting there. Even in India, it's 61%. Rwanda, Tanzania have some catching up to do, but many in the 70s, even the high 80% in terms of owning a mobile phone. And while there is a small gap between, next slide, urban and rural, um, yeah, that's the one. Um, while there is a small gap between urban and rural ownership of phones, it's still pretty respectable even in rural areas. There is a gap, but not too bad. Next slide, please. However, these are phones, not the kind of phones that you need for a decent internet experience. And that has to be a smartphone. So when you uh, tally up the basic phones, versus feature phones, which are, which are sort of keyboard phones, but are internet and data enabled, versus smartphones, the yellow, uh, the green, you can now see the difference in the poorest countries in each region. You see low, high ownership of phones still, but low ownership of smartphones. Again, Latin America is the lucky region with higher penetration, Africa and Asia quite low. And there's a big gap between people who just have a phone versus people who have a smartphone. Next slide. Now this is the smartphone data divided between urban and rural because this is about rural connectivity. And again, now you see the stark contrast in countries like Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya, and again, India and Cambodia, where there's a really a big gap in urban versus rural in smartphone ownership. In Peru, Paraguay, you see these differences as well. Next slide. So why is it that people don't have a smartphone, which is one of the basic preconditions? Affordability and relevance are the two most commonly cited reasons. The black is people who say, I don't need one. The bright red is people who say, I can't afford one. And these two are very important in different ways. And, these, and, and if you look at the affordability, these markets have the cheap Chinese smartphones in the market in almost all these countries and, and you know, at $30 each. And yet there's a population who perceives this as being too affordable. And in reality, it probably is not affordable. And I think even more dangerous is the group of people who say, I don't need one, because that is directly related to the relevance of the internet and that experience has to them. And we need to worry about that a lot more. Why do they even don't think they need a device that is really conducive to getting online, among other things, gaming, et cetera, right? Next slide. Um, so we looked at, in that previous graph, you know, there's a group who said it's not affordable. And we looked at urban versus rural. Of course, affordability is a bigger problem in rural areas for the smartphone, as we can see here in most countries with a few exceptions. Next slide. People who say, I don't need it. Small differences, but not a huge difference in urban versus rural. Skills. Uh, there's a group of people who say it is too complicated, and that is also a problem, operating this device. Uh, there's an urban-rural gap, but overall, there is a skills problem, I think. The difference is not the point here, that there is a skills problem. Sorry, this is the graph. I, I, I my my, my I apologies. Apologize. Next slide. Okay, phone is important. I keep talking about the phone because the phone is how people get online. This is why I don't focus on desktops and tablets because if you look at the numbers in our survey, they are very, very low and the first internet experience is on a mobile. Very short amount of time. The next barrier is awareness to the internet. There are still people who don't know what the internet is. When we ask them with a broad definition of what the internet is, the people who say no in red is still a significant portion. Next slide. This is awareness urban versus rural. And as you can see, the people who know about the internet always lower in, in rural areas. So more people are aware in urban. So this is the second barrier. Next. Uh, the limitations. Then we said, you know, why are you not online? And they said, you know, a whole set of reasons, saying, you know, I have no limitations, I don't have enough content, I don't have data, and so on. 
and you know, including things like I'm not allowed to use it. And really, we this is honestly too early for us to draw patterns because I'm looking at the data since last week, since we had all the data, but we need to go and look at this at the level of countries. As an example, this is just the Asia data. Next slide, thank you. Uh, looking at Bangladesh, Cambodia, and India in depth, you know, what are the main limitations? And you see speed of the internet shows up huge in Cambodia, the 71%. In other areas, it's lack of time and data costs and so on. So then we went and investigated, next slide. Actual, what does this say about urban versus rural speeds? In the 2000 enumerator areas, all the enumerators had mobile phones running uh, speed test, and they took multiple readings. So we had 24,000 or nearly 23,000 readings. For example, this is India. And surprisingly, we actually didn't see a huge difference in the speeds that we got. And this is quite a systematic test in all the areas across India. We did this for all the other countries. So if you can see the green line is, you know, urban, uh, urban red is rural, not a huge difference depending on the network. Uh, next slide, you can actually skip more readings on the data. However, what we did see in rural areas is network outing. So actually, an inability to suddenly get a signal is much more when you don't get a signal. That incidence was much higher in rural areas. So when you have a signal, it seems to work fine. But sometimes you actually don't have a signal, not because there is no connectivity there. Either the cell is breathing or something else. There's a mountain. There's various reasons for this. Finally, I'll leave you with this very confusing slide. When you put all the reasons for why people are not online together, you see sort of one of the dominant things is the dark red at the bottom. I do not know what the internet is, which for us, my region, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and India, this is very important. No access to the internet-enabled devices and no interest is the next, and that is the next reason. And that's more important in, let's say, Tanzania, depending on the country. So we really need to understand these things in depth for urban versus rural and try and solve these problems. So please, let's build it, but let's do other things so they actually come online. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eleni, for this. Um, I think I think the both panelists uh, said complementary things. Uh, they mentioned the, the access problem, but also several demand side uh, issues. And then I, I I will ask the same question to you: Are there any other challenges that uh, we haven't addressed? Are there any questions for for the panelists here? And and the other panelists are also welcome to intervene and add their own points to, to this uh, challenges uh, section. I'll, I'll open the floor for 10 minutes. Um. Is anyone remote, participating remotely? We have no questions yet. No? We have some questions, yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, a question for Halani. Um, back on your <laughs> ver very impressive um, slide. So how, how did you rate the affordability for the selection of countries that you surveyed? Uh, where was affordability in their relative purchasing power? Uh, oh, so that's not shown in this, Philippa. So we know, so this is what people say, right? I mean, as surveys are perfect or infer perfect instruments of what actual affordability is and what people perceive as barriers. This is people perceives bar perceived barriers, right? Uh, and it's, so that's why, for example, in Bangladesh and India, it's not the top reason, right? And we now have, in other work, we have looked at it. And in fact, Asia particularly, and Doreen, you've been in many places where I've said this, Asia has affordable internet, going by even the Broadband Commission's definition, under 5%, well under 3% of monthly income being spent online, and yet under 30% of the people are using the internet. So there are countries, I'm not denying affordability is a problem, it of course in some countries, but there are many countries, including India, where affordability is not the primary reason. It is affordable by accepted international standards. There are m other barriers, and something is stopping people from getting online. Well, many thanks. Um, are there any references? Oh, are there any questions from the floor? Yes, please. 
Hello. Um, Carlos Rey Moreno from the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, my, my question is for Helani. Helani, did you, just building up in your answer, uh, did you did any correlation in between the the different urban and rural populations and the affordability comment that you just made, or is is, is based on the on the average in, uh, individual income in the whole country, or did you try to to because I guess it depends per, depending on the rural and urban income. Yeah, um, not yet is the answer. Just simply because we didn't have time. Uh, so obviously that would be one thing to correlate uh, based on income. Uh, and urban and rural, actually, to cross tap that. I know that um, Bob Pepper wants to react to that. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, great data, Alani. As you know, I love data as well. Uh, and one of the things that I'm going to talk about later in terms of technology is some of the data as it relates to technology. But just here, I just want to note that um, last year, for the first, it was a kind of a beta test we're doing again this year, we're turning into a time series. We looked at 75 countries and 46 indicators for each of the 75 countries. And <clears throat> we did this with the Economist Intelligence Unit and they did all the data collection and data analysis. And all the data is available online um, because we think it's important to make data publicly available so people can do their own analyses. Um, but I want to go to the awareness question because the question you just pointed out, Melanie, is um, even where it's affordable and it's available, people are not necessarily getting online, and you talked about awareness. Um, one of the things that we did was that we looked at that, and we actually, uh, in the terms of clustering, doing the, the analysis and clustering the 46 variables, um, we came up with four areas, right? There's availability, which I'll talk about because that's the infrastructure, that's the supply side. Um, <clears throat> there was the affordability, which is sort of you already addressed and uh, obvious. And then the, the third was relevance and the fourth was readiness. Readiness was similar to the skills you were talking about. But specifically on the relevance, what we found was that the, um, there were a number of drivers and variables driving adoption in terms of relevance. Um, and there were two groups of content. We had one which was local content and local language, right? And that becomes essential. Um, it's a real driver. And then the second uh, uh, group of content variables, um, what we called relevant content, was e-gov applications, e-commerce applications, and e-entertainment. And um, so we got down to a pretty granular level on the demand driver for adoption and use, looking at some of those content variables. Uh, and what we found was that there was a, uh, again, going to the correlation question, a high you know, correlation relevance when we looked at local content and local language. And of course, that's really difficult in a country like India that has 1,400 local languages. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's not easy. Um, how many? 21 official languages. 21 official, but then there's a lot of the dialects, but yes. And so a lot of the, con well, maybe we'll get to this. Um, but the, the um, uh, e-gov applications, because that becomes especially what we found in emerging economies, e-gov applications that help people on their, in their daily lives um, have transactions and make things easier for them, working with government, whether it's registering a child's birth or paying taxes or uh, now, by the way, with the UID, the universal um, uh, ID in India, it's, it actually just has dramatically changed things. Um, that e-gov applications become a real driver. And that's something, again, public-private partnerships, content creation, the kinds of things that, Doreen, you talked about, actually become a driver for people to adopt and use mm -hmm. the internet. So this complements the, the, the work you're doing. Indeed. Can I just react to that? I find that interesting, and I should look this up, because what we see, and, and in terms of the most important they use that they make of the phone, certainly I'm really happy to hear that eGov is there because what we see is people just want to get on Facebook. That's our picture. Yes. <laughs> there, yeah. There's some reactions from the floor. I'd like to hear uh, from them, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Obam from Kenya. Um, this is a question, Doreen. What does the Broadband Commission consider to be broadband? Maybe Dr. Pepper can answer that since he's going to talk about technology as well. 
have we come to defining what we mean by broadband? So when we talk about access to broadband, we're talking about, are we talking about a speed? Are we talking about a type of technology? What do we mean by broadband? Thank you. Well, uh, maybe I can react to that uh, as OECD as well. Um, the definition of broadband is 256, uh, uh, right? Uh, and it, it does look very much outdated. And it's interesting because we're currently working on a paper uh, addressing the issue of rural broadband in OECD, and that's why we, we decided to convene this workshop. And one of the first questions that we asked ourselves is, okay, what is broadband? So I think your question is very, very relevant. Mm -hmm. The, the main problem right now is that even among OECD countries, there's no, uh, there's, there's no decision on what is, what is, how to upgrade this definition. What we've done so far is to do, uh, actually use uh, benchmarks of different speeds that in which we, we actually assess the penetration. So depending on, on the, the speed limits, we, we see how, how much of the country is actually covered with, with that service. But we see that question and the fact that we don't have a definition of broadband who's actually uh, uh, conducive with uh, the, the services that are out there to be a very big one but it requires uh, some sort of uh, harmonization and decision uh, uh, on a high level. And because many countries have already included definitions of broadband with specific uh, uh, technical definitions within the legal frameworks, within universal service uh, obligations, it's very, very hard to change. Uh, but it's something that we're certainly looking at least in, in the OECD to, to, to address. Uh, but it's, it's a very relevant question. So, Daniel, um, uh, Without defining what broadband is, and I'll come to this later, I don't want to use the time now, we actually, in the study with the economists, looked at um, uh, connectivity necessary. So the difference between being connected to the Internet and having an inclusive Internet is that you, with an inclusive Internet, you actually can have access to and use the rich applications that actually help people in, you know, in their lives, it actually makes a difference in terms of economic and social benefit. That's an inclusive internet. What we found was that a little bit more than half of the people who are connected are underconnected. So, in addition to the people who are unconnected, there is a large underconnected element, you know, part of the population because you, in order to really benefit, you have to have at least a 3G or 4G preferably connection to have the rich applications where everything is moving to video. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in terms of technology. It's not a, a definition issue. It's trying to be very pragmatic. What do you need to be able to actually use and benefit? And that turns out to be fairly robust high speed that is persistent. And persistence is one of the things, Helene, that you were talking about, about, you know, getting being dropped and so on. Yeah. There's a reaction there from yeah, Michael. Just, just a quick one uh, to Daniel and others. Uh, while there may not be a world standard for it, uh, I think uh, Robert uh, touched upon the thing, which is usability. And a readily available benchmark, I would say nothing below 1 MB is broadband. At this day and age, it's actually telegraph if it's below that. 2 MB is probably closer to the reality. In India, where I work, a 512 kbps is the official, and the talk is about raising it to 2 MBPS. But 1.5, I would say, is a good midpoint to beginning the discussion. Uh, we have other questions from the floor, please. Well, thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening presentation, Halani. Uh, I think in Kenya, anecdotally, what is uh, driving people to invest in mobile phones um, is social content, as you said, and financial applications, uh, not so much e-government. Actually, the users of e-government are usually the sophisticated uh, people who value their time, so um, they see a benefit in not queuing up for a service and rather just doing it on their phone, because of course there's a cost to that broadband, it's not, it's not free. Um, but I wanted to ask, uh, maybe just to follow on with what uh, Dr. Pepper has just said. Um, even though the issue of local language is very important, 
Uh, many people are not literate in their local languages because most of us are taught to read and write in uh, foreign languages. So I think the issue of multimedia content uh, is the one that I'd be very interested in because one, it's very, it's much easier to create, especially with today's uh, devices, people can use their phones to record content. And secondly, again, you don't need a lot of skill to um, watch multimedia, which you would to maybe develop special scripts or to have other types of content in local language. So I'd just like to hear from the panel whether anybody is looking at the uh, multimedia as opposed to the textual kind of uh, content. Maybe I'll get another reaction from the, for before uh, moving back to the panelists. Uh, I believe you had a question, yeah. Thanks. My name is Karen Rosen. I'm a consultant, and I recently moved to Algiers, Algeria, and uh, where the internet has uh, taken off rather quickly. And I have an opportunity a lot to interact with young people, and I ask them all the time, um, how many of you are on the internet? And you don't see many hands go up. And then you ask, how many of you use Instagram? How many of you use Facebook? How many of you go to the UEFA football scores? You know, all the boys' hands are up. Um, so, you know, people are more um, defining the internet in terms of their experience on the internet or the application on the internet rather than using the term of the plumbing, the internet itself. So my question is, I wonder as we go forward, um, when we do these surveys, how, uh, how much do we have to be careful about the terminology uh, in asking people whether they know about the internet because people aren't defining it in terms of the plumbing anymore? That's a very good question. Do we have any other um, questions from the floor? Yes. Thank you. Mugambi Nandi from Kenya. Uh, just a quick one for Helani. In the uh, age demographics, I just wanted to know what sort of importance to put on the various uh, seg segments in, in, the, in the age gap because you've got a very wide range. Um, so I would be worried about yeah. the lower ages sure. talking about relevance Indeed. than I would about affordability and vice versa. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question, yeah. and then I'll come back to the panel, but we need to, to start the second uh, part of the workshop. Is anyone looking at these issues um, alongside rural electrification um, issues? It seems like there's some opportunity for partnerships there. So c if you can uh, please react uh, quickly yeah. because when we we're talking about rural part. electrification, it's just not rural electrification. Many places in India has electric connectivity. However, how long are they on is an issue. Whether people are able to charge their mobiles, charge their, because most of the internet usage in India is on mobiles. So that is a question. And there are certain uh, or, um, private organizations who are coming up with innovativeness in the mobiles in terms of charging, et cetera, to kind of bridge it. But yes, that's important. Yes, Michael. Um, I'm not, I don't know if you know there's a plethora, there's a proliferation of organizations addressing exactly that question. Um, there are people here from various technology companies who actually fund directly uh, uh, these organizations. Uh, after the session, I'll be happy to point them out. Um, I would leave you, though, with the question on whether bundling is always the best solution. Um, energy is, a, is an extremely important thing. Connectivity is an important thing. Um, two important things are not always uh, uh, the greatest synergy. Thank you for that, Michael. And then I'll pass to uh, Dr. Pepper to yeah, I want to come back to the multimedia question uh, that was asked. Um, uh, so, okay. Okay. Um, so one of the things that uh, when I was at Cisco, I worked with the, the, the people who did the visual network and index forecast. It's a brilliant study you should look for. It. They do it every year. They've been doing it now for 12 or 13 years. And a number of years ago, uh, we, we forecast that 80% of the data on both either fixed or mobile uh, networks was going to be video. And actually, it's already happened. Mm -hmm. So people at the time said, oh, that's crazy. Well, it's, it's already happened. 
And one reason is everything is, is moving to multimedia, meaning, frankly, video, whether it's short form video, long form video, YouTube video, video clips on Facebook or Twitter, um, you all send little GIFs, video. And one of the nice things about video in native local language is that the applications are content in local language. It's no longer meaning text. So your point is absolutely correct. And in fact, in um, uh, uh, countries that have low literacy rates in terms of traditional reading and writing or using, you know, keyboards or, you know, with very simple uh, interfaces and now moving to voice interface where you can actually speak to the device and it will respond. Um, this also is driving adoption uh, for the reasons that you said. So there is some evidence of that. And I think, frankly, that's also the future. Thank you very much. And then for Sebastian. Yeah, just a, a quick comment, and I'm going to paraphrase um, Carlos Rey Moreno here that we had a, a, a conversation yesterday on electricity. And it's there, there is a direct relationship between uh, the experience that you have uh, online and the availability of, of, of electricity because of the devices you, you're going to use. I mean, there's devices that are, will last longer, and the battery will last, last longer, but the inclusivity of, that, of those devices is less than the smartphone that will last less in, in without the, the, I mean, recharging opportunity. And, and about the terminology, I think it's, uh, it's quite important because when you talk about connecting to the internet, I mean, you mean two different things, actually. I mean, for my generation, connecting to the internet is, is a dial-up thing that you are on and off, online, offline. For uh, the sake of this conversation, I think connecting to the internet is connecting those that are not connected, those who are connected to it. I already connected. I mean, we don't connect and, and, and disconnect anymore. I mean, yeah. Uh, um, on the age thing, absolutely. These are things that we need to be looked at in the next level. This is not fair to, just as, you know, we know urban and rural are different. Different age groups are different. Di di uh, different income levels are different. Different education level people will use it differently. So this is the next level of analysis, clearly. I think the... Internet usage terminology is an interesting one. And I mean, <laughs> we've been doing these surveys since 2005, and we used to, back in the day, ask, do you use the internet? And the numbers were very low. In 2010, we asked again the number. And for example, in Indonesia, among all the p people at the base of the pyramid, representative sample, 7% said, I use the internet. And yet, when we go to field research repeatedly, all these people were using Facebook. So luckily, I mean, a good reporter called at the time, and this is a hugely circulated article on Medium, which actually addressed this. Millions of people may not know that they're even using the internet. So obviously, learning from that, now our surveys, first of all, expand on this definition. Do you use the internet, which could include anything from a browser? Do you pay for the, any kind of data connectivity? Do you use Facebook? So it's a very, very broad definition. And then in the survey questionnaire, we have other internal verification methods also by asking other behavioral and usage questions to then verify that the answer is correct. So you can keep improving on this, but your point is relevant. And we've already learned from it. Thank you very much. I'll, I need to start the second half, but then I'll come back to the questions at the end. Um, so now we're going to the second part, which is uh, on the innovations. And uh, we've already discussed uh, some of them here, but uh, we'll just start with the policy perspective and then we'll go to technology. So starting on the policy will be uh, Bengt uh, Molliard. Uh, Bengt is a senior analyst uh, at the Swedish Post and Telecommunications Agency since 2009. He works with issues as cost modeling, cost of capital, price regulation, market research, investment analysis of operators. He's also a guest research at Wireless at KTH, which is the Royal uh, Institute of Technology in Stockholm, pursuing tech, techno-economic research and teaching on the communication sector. Um, I'll pass the word for you, Ben. Uh, th thank you, Lorraine, and thank you. And also thank you for being able to be here to participate in this uh, important workshop. So clearly, I'm coming from the north, so you have to bear with me. It's a Scandinavian and Swedish perspective, but nevertheless, some of these issues are also general, I would say generic. So t to begin with, demand. I mean, the question is, could policies foster demand, create demand, drive demand? Sorry, 
but uh, policymakers could not do that, and that was just underscored in the previous in the previous talks. But what I think policymakers could do is really they could not create a market because there has to be a genuine demand from users, from end users, from local communities, local businesses. And these end users, the customers or the people living there, also have to have both time and money because basic infrastructure requires extensive capital. And it's a high fixed cost, uh, which implies economy of scale. And that means that it's better than many can share the cost, basically. And to facilitate the, the deployment of network, people have to aggregate demand, and that's where the users come in. Really to aggregate demand, which is a question of evolving the community to get people on board, to get the ball rolling. Because you can say on the first wave of uh, fiber-driven community networks in Sweden, they formed small communities, and there are almost 1,000 of them today. And this is basically, it could be referred to as community networks, which has been expressed, uh, uh, talked about in, in other workshops here. And also a book has recently published on community networks. But the dilemma is that the first wave of these fiber pioneers, they have got older and they are not, and the networks are being deployed by professional operators nowadays. So it's meaning that the first wave of people building networks is one thing, but the long-term maintenance to maintain this infrastructure in the long term is a challenge. And that's why in Sweden you can see now that more commercial operators taking over, but the people there uh, locally was instrumental in making the, these networks possible. And second, it requires involvement, engagement of municipalities, region, policy makers have a role to engage, set broadband targets, engage people. I will say that there is a significant role for policy makers in municipalities to form broadband plans, to set broadband targets, to formulate digital agendas, to involve communities, schools, public offices, healthcare and companies. Certainly, access to broadband does not solve all problems, but it could clearly contribute to offset urbanization, enable people to maintain living in rural areas, and policymakers should work for state aid on the regional levels, also really to complement bottom-up financing. So this is really on the, on the policy side to promote the ideas of connectivity, to spread the words basically, to, uh, to foster and support demand. And thirdly, the building network is a very local thing. It's a, a thing that creates a, a physical thing and deploying networks. So the question of rights of way, how these networks are deployed, actually deployment techniques, and there are policy makers are decision makers. Policy makers and municipalities play an important role as decision makers for, for various permits and they should allow for low cost deployment techniques. Like in, in our country, micro trenching is one way of take, uh, deploying fiber networks at a lower cost compared to, to traditional methods, plowing, and there can also be other ways to do this. And it can also involve sponsored mobile base stations, for example. And also rights of way, access to property could be handled in an efficient way uh, uh, in order to, to improve uh, and smoothen the process. And also the question of the cost. I know that uh, a lot of property owners are, are eager to, to have charge high, high bills, but the formula in Sweden has been in order to deploy fiber networks is really that on, on the terms where, where the local property owners are prepared to, to provide this as a low cost. Fourthly, to go ahead to build community networks, municipal networks, or form private-public partnership. If the community or municipality have the right competence, they could initiate network planning to go about and build networks. Municipal networks could be complement to electricity networks. And this has happened in Sweden where since roughly the last 20 to 25 years, there are roughly 180 municipal networks which really is providing access to people living out in rural areas. Or it could also be a question of public-private uh, partnership. 
And fifth, policies should not undermine private investments. And publicly sponsored networks should also be opened, allowing competition on services. Clearly, the issue of competition is, is, is critical because although the, there is a need uh, involvement of public and state in when it comes to deploying network in rural areas, competition from private networks is essential. And, but this is building upon the fact that there is a demand from end users. And what we have seen in Sweden so far is that the border from where they are able to build has extended over the time because of deployment is, is it possible at a lower cost. In the same time, there is a growing demand. People want to be connected at all times, regardless of where they live. So this is really that they are commercially possible to deploy fiber networks also to, to rural areas. This means that there is a, currently a massive deployment is ongoing. And there is basically a market. There is a potential cash flow for, for investors. And there is also possibility for private networks to deploy. And there is a, a business case. But as I said, deployment of networks require massive capital. We can never avoid that. And this, certainly the state or regional financing is, 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 a, is a requirement on top of private money or, or local money in order to, to make this possible in order to, to deploy networks. So to summarize, the policy issues is really on demand. And this is not a policy issue. This is a people question. Because I will clearly see that to be connected and the willingness to be demand is so to raise demand, to talk about this, the active role of users should, should not be underestimated. And certainly, there has to be willingness to pay for this as well, and also the time to spend time to aggregate the demand. And then they have the second, the active role of policymakers in municipalities. They have a, a key role to play to support the regional development and support local initiatives. And then thirdly, the dynamic policymakers enabling the rights away, allowing cost-efficient deployment techniques. And that's, for example, like micro-trenching, I said, is, is, is taking down the cost considerable. And as we see now in Sweden, all the deployment of fiber is ongoing, that more and more municipalities are, are making, are prepared to do that. And also, the fourthly, the deploy community networks, municipal networks, if there is no one else building the network, is uh, uh, given that the right conditions are in place. And fifth, uh, if really in the same time to love competition and private investment should not be underestimated because basically we talk about long-term investment uh, and to stimulate investment is key in order to build and facilitate these networks and that these networks could be open because when the state aid or some uh, public involvement, the networks are open for service competition and there could also be public, uh, public partnership in order to uh, facilitate this network. And finally, because of the, the demand building on these other steps that I mentioned, there is also a possibility to facilitate more ambitious national broadband targets. And this is what's happened in Sweden, that the government is seeing that demand is growing, networks are deployed, really triggering the, the government to, to enhance the, the targets for, for broadband in order to, to and also with the complement with state aid. So in, in the end here, it needs to be state aid to, to to close the final gap for the last mile or the first mile. But ultimately, we have to have a strong involvement from end users and local communities, which will contribute to shape a sustainable long-term connectivity for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bent, uh, for bringing the policy perspective. And now I'm going to pass uh, to Sebastian Balagamba. Uh, he's the Regional Bureau Director of Latin America and the Caribbean at the Internet Society, ISOC. Uh, prior to joining ISOC, uh, he worked in the internet service providers industry, found in running several ISPs in Argentina. Uh, currently, he's based in Montevideo, Uruguay. Yeah, thank you. That's correct. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Um, uh, it's very interesting, this panel, and I think uh, it's very, I mean, Doreen told us that uh, 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 an important thing, 50% uh, roughly of the population is not yet connected to the internet, and that's something that we have to lead our preoccupations. Um, we also know that um, this, uh, most of these people that is not connected lives in rural areas. And Helene 
uh, Hinani, sorry, um, introduce you to the difference between the rural and, 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 urban, and urban situations, and which is really good. I think we have to hurry up, guys, I mean, to, to, to sort this out, because um, although no other technology has been deployed at such a rapid pace as the, as the internet in, this, in the history of uh, humankind, um, we, have a, we have still a big problem. 50% of the population is not yet connected to the internet. The internet, uh, we, see it the, we see the internet as the, the vehicle for social uh, and economic progress uh, and human uh, uh, well-being. So if we agree with that, we have to hurry up. We have to hurry up because this digital gap is uh, actually widening, uh, is not getting uh, thinner. Uh, in which sense? I mean, the uh, relative number is still getting bigger, so apparently we're getting close to, to bridge the digital divide. But actually the cost of people, for people that is not yet connected, is bigger than ever. I, I have a saying, I mean, which is not exactly true, but when we were, there, there were 10% of, of, of the population of the, the world connected to the internet, the real life was offline. Today, real life mostly happens online. Uh, if you're not connected to the internet today, you're not accessing the financial services that, that the lady from Kenya was, was saying, you're not accessing the multimedia, etc. But most of the real things that you have to do to, to carry on with your daily life goes, is online. So those people that are left behind are being more and more being left behind uh, in any second. So we have to, to, to do it, and we have to do it now, by 2020, as we, we all agreed upon. Um, innovation is this, uh, this part. I, I, I think there is several things. One, one has to do with, the, with the technical innovation. There is a lot of things going on um, uh, in, in the innovation side, I mean, for, for bridging this, uh, this digital gap. But I think one of the most important innovation is, is kind of a social innovation that that is already there, it's not innovation. I mean, I, and I would like to highlight the, the, the community networks space. I mean, uh, if we see the, the, the pyramid of world population and the connection, uh, we've been growing the, the uh, we've been connecting people to the internet uh, with a spillover effect, I mean, almost organically, I mean, from the top, just spilling over right away to the bottom. That is not fast enough, I mean. Uh, it's been proven that it's not fast enough. So we have to, to modify our approach. We have to go to the bottom and from the bottom up. That is exactly what the community, uh, community networks is doing. So we have to get all our support on that. I mean, community networks are doing a great job and in helping us putting two sides of the digital divide and getting, and getting these two sides together. There is many things that we can do for, for helping these people uh, working on, on community networks, and I would like to, to highlight some, some titles in the, for the sake of time. But uh, policy-related issues, uh, the, basically three, three things. A spectrum, the most efficient way for, for community networks to, to reach uh, people in sparse populated areas is wireless. So we need uh, to let them work with good spectrum. What it means, I mean, good spectrum is not very scientific. Uh, Good spectrum is where equipment is easily and cheaply available. Um, second, licensing. We need to allow community networks to work on a uh, under a legal environment. We, we, would, we don't want anyone to go to jail, basically. Um, third, clever use of universal service funds. We have a tool there. I mean, it's being unutilized, unutilized in, many, in many of our countries. It, a good use for, for universal service fund is this. We have to build capacities. We have to create the capacities everywhere for people to set up their own community networks. Community networks, have, and thanks to the English grammar, I mean, in Spanish it would be the other way around, but um, the good thing about community networks is that community goes before networks. It's the community that is, go, that is going on top. I mean, in, in Spanish, it would be the other way around. The adjective would, be, would go second. But I, I, I'll use the English grammar for, for, for the sake of, uh, of the analogy. Three, uh, we need to um, create communities, communities of community networks. I mean, and we have to allow them to, to get together and, and to, to be more efficient, to share practices. I mean, we have to 
uh, potentiate the, the, the community uh, networks uh, community. And finally, we have to help them deploy more net networks. I mean, they need um, resources in, in any kind. I mean, human resources, they need money, they need everything. So we, ne we need to support these, these guys that are, are working on the community networks field and will be doing something to, to bridge the digital divide for less. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for highlighting community networks case. Uh, now I'm going to um, move to giving the word to Michael uh, Gingold. Uh, he's the CEO of Air Jaudi Networks, a private company dedicated to bringing fast and reliable internet to rural India through wireless technologies. Has a lot of experience with rural remote areas. I'll, I'll give you the word now. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, proper disclosure, uh, director, strategy, and operations. Um, I'm going to uh, um, try and take uh, a lot of what we've been discussing so far to a local uh, space, which is uh, India. Um, I'll try and divide it into three things. Um, I'll talk about existing policies and technologies, um, technologies and policies that are coming up and end up with a wish list, and I'll try and do it with six minutes, I promise. Um, just uh, uh, two or three words about Air Jaldi. Air Jaldi is a rural ISP, as uh, uh, Kala said. Uh, we started our work in 2009. We now have networks in eight Indian states covering about 30,000 square kilometers, serving above uh, 230,000 registered uh, users. But we began our life as a community network with 25 uh, users way back when in 2007. Um, so a bit of experience on, on both. Um, the reason I'm going to talk about India is not because I think India is the only place in the world and not because I expect you to, all of you to be interested in India, but I think um, some of the examples that I'll talk about will have relevance beyond India. So what's existing? Um, India is in the midst of a huge drive uh, for uh, additional connectivity in rural areas. Um, there is the NOFEN scheme, National Optic Fiber Networks, uh, about $3 billion have been invested in reaching 250,000 um, gram panchayats, which are village, uh, 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 the lowest administrative units in, in India. Uh, this is augmented by uh, another investment of about $10 billion to put hotspots in these uh, uh, locations. Um, some of the interesting things that are happening is beyond the local drive to do it, uh, which is really a, a, a supply side uh, a drive, as uh, uh, Robert Pepper said earlier, is that some governments took the initiatives uh, on their own and said, hang on, we'll do it ourselves. And they're coming up with very innovative things. So for example, the government of Andhra Pradesh, which is in the south of India, um, said, okay, we've got a right of way problem and rolling out fiber is gonna take a long time. But hang on, the state uh, electricity company is also owned by us. So they just strung it on top of the electricity wires. Um, it's much, much cheaper, um, very, very quick. And they also became aggregator of content and aggregators of bandwidth. And then they have a really, really interesting, uh, I don't think triple play is talking about that, but a really interesting triple play for ISPs to come and use. You know, there's the infra, there's the lower bandwidth, and there's uh, content that's been aggregated. Um, there's also uh, market forces that are happening. India has been looking at uh, probably the biggest rollout of 4G networks in, in known history. Um, um, a pri one private company called Geo invested $30 billion in building a network in India. They have provided bandwidth for free for a year. Um, if you're an ISP, you will appreciate what it means to operate under uh, a regime where everything is free and you're trying to sell, and uh, free calls. Um, how does that, and, and there's also a massive uh, uh, expansion of other companies. Airtel, biggest uh, provider in India, is investing three billion in, 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 in uh, um, upgrading their fiber networks. What does it mean for us as, uh, uh, what does it look like in a rural area and for Air Jaldi? So first of all, uh, huge competition. On the other hand, um, lower costs. Um, our expansion is now fueled by, by lower bandwidth costs. Um, the technology, that we use, we use mostly Wi-Fi, is mature. There are improvements to it. Um, better distances, dealing with interferences, higher data rates, and so on. But the other thing that's happening, and that's kind of a, 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 a simulating what's happening uh, uh, with the larger players, scale is beginning to be an issue. If you cannot scale as an operator, as an ISP, 
um, you're going to be hitting uh, uh, the problem of uh, economies of scale or the lack thereof. And, and uh, I'm happy to report that we as Erjaldi uh, are managing to do that, to grow. Uh, what's on the horizon? Um, prices in India now, even after uh, uh, they've moved from free, are probably amongst the lowest in the world, uh, especially when it comes to use of mobile technology or uh, public hotspots. Uh, proper disclosure, uh, we do some of this work with uh, uh, Facebook and a project called Express Wi-Fi, of which we are uh, probably the first ones in India to do it. Um, prices are very, very low. The market will, will rationalize, however, because it's, uh, right now it's a battle of giants. The floor is very slippery with blood. We slip on it, but it will stabilize. And when it stabilizes, a very, very interesting thing that will happen is that um, the millions and millions of people who were onboarded uh, um, on data services in India this year will continue to be data users. Um, they will not drop off. I want to actually make a comment about this thing, a connect and they won't come. Um, my humble experience, as I said, 30,000 square kilometer, kilometers, eight states, is that if you bring it, they will come. And if the price point is right, they will use. And uh, um, people talked about digital content. There's something called YouTube. I think everybody knows it. Uh, you'll, you'll be surprised how, f how quickly people find it. Um, what technology? Um, so we talked a little bit about, about uh, uh, fiber, a little bit about Wi-Fi. There's a whole gamut of very, very interesting technologies that need to be used or could be used and are available and the battle rages. Um, there's, a, a, there's a range called TV white spaces, um, which was used traditionally UHF by TV channels. Um, it offers some very, very interesting possibilities for rural areas. Unfortunately, in most countries in the world, it is still uh, uh, held very, very tightly and not given as unlicensed. Although there are very, very interesting possibilities of doing it, even when you sell the spectrum. Uh, other technologies are E-band, which is the high gigahertz range. Um, very, very high rates of data delivery um, across distances as far as 10 kilometers. V-band, which is again another uh, uh, gigahertz uh, technology, very, very good for short distances. I've got one minute, I'll finish. Um, there's also fiber optics. Uh, guys like Google Alphabet are testing technologies that are, do up to 20 kilometers and 20 gigs. For us, we're technology agnostic. As a rural ISP, our job is to do uh, the best that we can. Give good service, stable service, fast service. 256 is not fast, 256 is telegraph. And do it in a stable manner. And all of these technologies help. Um, on the wish list, I'd like to end that and I'll take maybe 30 seconds for that. Um, I would like to see, uh, um, somebody talked about USO funds. Uh, good luck with trying to unlock this. These usually are huge tenders. Um, the ability to parse out uh, huge tenders that use USO funds or any government-led thing to smaller packages will help to actually realize them. Uh, we could think about an outcome-driven uh, drive, whereby I, as a government, do not, for example, subsidize building NOFIN, but I come to an ISP and I'll say, I'll subsidize every user that you have by X percentage, and it's easy because we're an IP-based service. And we'll give them the GUI, the graphic user interface, and we can measure it on a daily basis. Uh, chances of leakages are, are very, very low. Um, this is something that I've been pushing personally uh, very hard. Um, more than that, I think we need to begin to think, and I know that it's not, might be the, this may not be the topic of this panel, we need to think of internet for what? So great, they're connected, they're literate one way or the other. Internet has many, many other things that it can do and I think it's our joint responsibility to be doing that. And what I'm talking about is three things that I think are crucial and where the internet can help. One is the environment, environmental monitoring, the ability to do something about it. I have some good examples from India but no time. The second thing is precision agriculture. We can do a lot based in a rural area to develop agriculture that optimizes the use of inputs and therefore reduces the environmental impact, optimizes the income of, of, uh, uh, of farmers. And the third thing is water usage. A huge issue, um, I live in a country that has, in India right now, although I come from Israel, there is no reason for India to be thirsty. Um, once we start reducing the 40 or 60 percent, uh, percent uh, water loss that exists. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that. You, you raised some very interesting uh, points. I'll now come back to uh, Amrita uh, Chuduri. Uh, she serves as director of CCAOI, a not-for-profit trust working with internet stakeholders living in rural and semi-rural uh, areas in India. So, Srita, you have five minutes. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. I know we have a global audience, but I'm sorry I would limit my comments mostly to my experiences of India because I operate from there and to a certain extent of South Asia, uh, primarily also because we are the second largest internet base and we have more than one million people to connect. So we are in both sides. We uh, constitute about 30% of the total offline population, actually. Um, I was told to speak about the new policy initiatives which, has, uh, which the government has undertaken or the country has looked at. Um, for us, both the supply and demand are a challenge uh, because we have a rural area where uh, the initial focus is primarily to increase the coverage. Um, and we are obviously 2G dominated even now. Um, there have been quite a few policies which has been rolled out and Michael had been speaking for about a few, like the national optic fiber network called Bharat Broadband, which is supposed to connect till the village level. Um, they are ambitious plans. Things have happened to a certain extent, but more can happen. Um, there is an initiative where uh, virtual network operators and mobile virtual network operators can provide connectivity uh, where the ISP might not want to go into. Uh, there have been also recommendations um, to increase the, cover the rural coverage through Wi-Fi, where in uh, village level entrepreneurs are uh, being um, encouraged to provide internet uh, from the last mile of the fiber optic to the villages. Um, so these are certain new initiatives which is on. However, more can be done in that uh, perspective. And we also have the National Telecom Policy 2018 coming up where um, certain stakeholders have been making certain um, recommendations. Um, if we look at the rural market today, the issue is actually that these markets are weak in t and there, there is a need to uh, bridge the viability gap. Um, However, it's very interesting to see that the rural areas, which is near the urban areas, people are using internet access. So perhaps the operators or the ISPs can learn the lessons of what people use in those areas. Um, simultaneously, if you're looking at the, uh, you know, the policy perspectives which are needed to uh, bridge the viability gap, um, it could also be in terms of using the USO funds, the Universal Service Obligation Funds, more efficiently. Currently, it is only being given to certain selected operators. Rather, if also the other private ISPs or the telecom providers are given certain subsidies, one of which Michael mentioned, as you know, incentivizing them by the number of rural users they have, perhaps it can incentivize private players to get into the markets and bridge to a certain extent the viability gap. There is also um, and a recommendation made by the T Telecom Regulatory Authority of India that certain amount of uh, particular internet bandwidth be provided to rural uh, citizens when they are using internet. Uh, however, um, the Department of Telecom which actually looks after the uh, connectivity portion, there are some concerns and we wait to see what happens in that recommendation. On the supply side, if we look at it, broadband data service is actually a vanilla service and the policies need to reflect how to make the internet more relevant for users so that the rural users uh, feel the need to use internet. For example, plumbers and electricians in India understand the value of uh, the mobile phone and they carry a mobile phone. So if even a plumber or, internet, uh, or electrician know that a WhatsApp, for example, I'm just taking, uh, can help them in their business, they will definitely do so. And uh, just to mention, if a person is using um, Facebook or uh, you know, they are using any other service, a YouTube or anything, it's absolutely fine the way they use it, as long as they start using internet. Um, simultaneously, the localized content 
uh, regional level content is very important to ensure that the local people are online. And if you're looking at subsidies, perhaps certain, um, the subsidies need to go to the users. Also, if there can be bundled services, say for example, health, women, etc., give uh, certain pr public services which can be bundled, there can be u more usage amongst the people. Mm -hmm. um, investment definitely is something which if the government does is great. Uh, the private uh, operators need to have the liberty to uh, innovate. Uh, in fact, there are discussions that the licenses should be so developed that there is scope for innovation currently which is limited to a certain extent. And also, if we look at the national optic, uh, the fiber optic which is being laid, at times government does not have the expertise. So it's better to have a public-private partnership wherein there is some amount of innovation which has come. And also, it is important to see why people in rural areas need internet. A small example, I'm sorry I'm taking time. When telephone first came into India, people were given local calls free in the rural areas. However, it was never used. The reason being, local people talk to each other. But when I, the, S, the STD or ISD, the national or uh, you know, the international calls were reduced, people started using. That's because there were many migrant people to the urban areas or the other areas, and that's what induced them to do. So it's very important to understand what is the actual need of the rural area. Thank you. I think I've overshot my time. Thank you very much, Amrita. I'll now go back to the technology uh, part, but uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll talk about policy as well uh, with Dr. Robert Pepper. He's the head of global connectivity and technology policy in Facebook, and formerly he was the vice president for global technology policy at Cisco. So to you. Thank you. Um, so I will try to be brief because we have 12 minutes to the end of the, uh, uh, the workshop. Um, but I'll also try to not make it analog compression that I speak so quickly you can't understand. Um, so we've heard a lot about the gaps. I talked earlier about the EIU study that we, that we do with the EIU called the Internet Inclusion Index, uh, in which one of the things we identified, not only the unconnected but the underconnected parts of the world. <coughs> um, and the point I made earlier is that if you really want to have all the benefits that we were just hearing about, you have to have a robust, persistent, high-speed, quality connection to the Internet. Um, and um, so the question is, how do you do that? And what is preventing people from being connected? Uh, the first thing, clearly, because it's all wireless, we've already heard about the need for more spectrum. Spectrum that is both licensed as well as unlicensed. Both, it's not one or the other, it's all of the above, um, for different purposes. Um, we tend to, uh, at Facebook, uh, work very closely with um, ISPs, whether it's, um, you know, a uh, wireless ISP with, um, in India, using uh, Express Wi-Fi, I was going to talk a little bit about that, so Express Wi-Fi equipment, um, or it's with mobile operators, um, uh, we see this as a symbiotic relationship, very important, mutually beneficial. At, because the world is moving to video and very high-speed applications that actually bring the benefits, we need really high-speed, robust, great networks. And then the content that we provide along with others um, are what really creates the demand that creates the, um, uh, the, the, the opportunity for new business cases, because a lot of the, the issues are about business cases and how do you attract the investment, the long-term investment, the sustainable investment. And, and, and focusing on the underconnected and unconnected, so first thing is you need more spectrum, that's obvious. All right, I'll move on from that, that's easy. It's not easy necessarily, but we can, we know that, all right, and we, and we actually know how to solve that problem. It turns out that when we do the granular, granular analysis, the biggest technical barrier to really scaling to full internet inclusion in these robust networks is the, is the lack of backhaul, right? It's not access. We have all kinds of low-cost access technologies, but you have to have the backhaul that gets you there. So when, you know, if you have a mobile operator that is, that is working and has a 2G network that covers people but can't scale beyond text, what do you do? 
And a concrete example, by the way, we are completely technology neutral. Whatever technology works, right, we're happy to help um, deploy. We actually have engineers. I tease them sometimes. They're turning science fiction into reality, creating new technologies that we I think can be used to solve these backhaul problems in a very concrete way. Um, so the mobile operator that has good 2G coverage, but they can't get good broadband to their mobile towers, the towers, I'm sorry, the towers are not mobile. Um, they don't move, um, right? So how do you get the, 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 the good backhaul so to the tower so you can have a good mobile operation and, and network to be able to support the smartphone handsets. Um, a good example of that is Airtel in uh, Uganda. Um, in Uganda, approximately 80 to 85 percent of people have available to them a 2G uh, GSM voice connection. But in rural parts of Uganda, there's no way to scale to broadband off of the same tower. You can't put in a 3G antenna base station or a 4G base station if you're running off of a two megabit you know, backhaul or a satellite link. So in a, the type of project that we're involved in, is, a, and, and Uganda is a good example, we partnered with uh, Airtel and a small uh, infrastructure uh, operator called BCS, and we just finished last month, building and turning on a 770 kilometer fiber core network to their towers. It's an open fiber. We believe in open uh, networks uh, that, if, you know, that any operator can then become part of for the backhaul, the core, and then they can have their own networks and services um, at the edge. Um, so we've already seen this move the needle in terms of not just the number of people connected, but the types of things they're able to do. It's making a difference, right? That's real infrastructure investment. Um, a second example of a different technology is what do you do when there's no towers? Or, or there's really, it's, it's even more difficult <laughs> until you can build the fiber. So we have a project called Aquila. Um, and this is a very long-term project, right? It's long-term investment. Um, it started in 2015, uh, 2014 and 15, with a couple of people who had this crazy idea <clears throat> that maybe what we can do is have drones that will fly at 20 kilometers up above weather, aircraft. They'll have a wingspan of a 737, but weigh 440 kilos. Be solar powered, fly for three months at a time. And there'll be hundreds of them that'll be connected and meshed together with laser beams. Sounds pretty crazy, right? Um, actually, the first one, the test aircraft flew in 2016. We did it again. We, we took the, the, the learnings from that and did that uh, again uh, this year on the aircraft side. Um, but there are other things that are going on. So we have, we're, we're building te radio technologies to beam up from a cable landing station to one of these Aquilas. And then we're building technology for laser beams to connect and mesh together. And then when they're over a medium density village, they can beam down using radio again. We have no intention of operating that. We don't want it. We're inventing the technology and making it available to network operators, a consortium of network operators, individual network operators, others that want to provide the backhaul service using the technology. Now, we're not in the airframe aircraft business, but we got this started because nobody thought it could be done. And last month, um, uh, again, we do things on non-exclusive basis. Last month, Airbus said they were interested, so they're going to be part of the project. And they, they'll be doing, and others as well, the airframe. But we're developing the payloads, both uh, and testing with the radios and the laser beams. Again, if it, by the way, this is a project that started in 2014, 15, we had to go to the World Radio Conference, and in my session earlier this morning, one of the things I pointed out, the ITU's been great. I mean, the world, the radio part, I mean, making these things available, right, is essential, and it can't be done without the good work of the, of the, the, the people at, w, at uh, ITUR, right, in the WRC. But we're going to have to go back to the WRC in 19, and then maybe if we pull it all together, we'll have these things up and really, we're going to do tests before that really deployed by 2022. 
That's a seven and eight year project. It's long term. It's highly risky. It might not work. We think it will. But these are the kinds of big bets with tech, new technologies to solve these really difficult problems in rural parts of the world that are not connected and are underconnected. Real fast, because my time is up, I just love, um, Michael, you gave three things, your wish list, the internet for what, environment, precision agriculture, and, and, and water security. <clears throat> Pippa and I, oh, this is um, uh, Philippa Briggs from the ITU, it's not, no longer Doreen. Um, Pippa and I and Anna, no, um, we worked together with a colleague of, of mine, uh, John Garrity, and was it two years ago we issued a report partnering with the ITU, great staff, um, uh, on linking and mapping Internet of Things with the SDGs. And these three areas were three examples of using digital technology, Internet of Things, and how they can, in a very practical, concrete way, help people save lives and address, really improve the SDGs and accelerate achieving the SDGs. So I just want to thank Anna, Pippa, uh, and then by the way, on another project we've collaborated with as a co-author was Lorraine uh, with the ITU as well. So this is a, it's a great staff uh, that helps on these things. But that, Michael, is exactly, and I, if you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll point you to the report. Thank you. So we have uh, three minutes to finish the session. Um, I don't think we're going to have time maybe for uh, one comment or question. Um, probably not a good idea at this point. But, uh, but well, I just wanted to say that uh, I think the amount of topics that we cover in this workshop is, is really, it's illustrating the, how much work uh, we still need to do and uh, how many topics uh, we can cover when talking only about uh, rural broadband. And uh, I, I mean, we mentioned in the first part the challenges and we raised many questions regarding uh, connectivity and, uh, and effective connectivity in terms of uh, affordability and relevancy of content, for example. In the second part, we, we touched into some issues uh, regarding uh, innovative policies, so we raised uh, uh, the issue of backhaul, uh, spectrum, open access, community networks, uh, but also some very interesting uh, innovative uh, technology uh, uh, solutions that are out there trying to, to bridge the gap in, in, in rural areas. And um, I, I think the conclusion uh, from, from this, uh, this panel is that uh, there's a lot of uh, good work that is being done uh, policymakers uh, across the world are are looking at this issue. Uh, it is a, it's certainly a priority for for many countries uh, uh, from the OECD. It's not an issue that it's uh, it's even close from being solved. But uh, I think the the conclusion is that working private sector with policymakers together, trying to assess uh, these gaps, trying to look into what policy instruments are at the disposal and what private, sectors are, uh, uh, what private sector is doing to actually develop uh, uh, solutions uh, is, is the way to go. I do hope that in the next IGF we're not going to have one, but uh, several workshops that are, are, are tackling this issue. Uh, it's, uh, it's a true broad of an issue for us to, to, to discuss only one hour and a half. But uh, I thank you very much for your participation and for uh, your, your excitement with your questions from the audience as well. Uh, I think we all take this matter very, very seriously. And um, I'm sure the panelists will, will be around though, for at least a, a couple of minutes if you want to interact more. Uh, thank you very much.